All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In my studies this morning, I got to studying and reviewing the next hour's message. And sometimes when I review, I like to go over my notes over and over and over again. So I'm very familiar with what's down on paper here, and I can add things to it and take things away from it, and whatever the thoughts God gives me. But often when I review, I come to the realization that there's just too much there for one service, just too much. So we're going to break this, this up into two, and we'll begin in Sunday school and just carry over into the next hour. We'll take a little break, and then we'll finish this message the next hour. Amen. I'm glad to be in church. Like Thane prayed, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a blessed thing to have the truth and to have a church where the truth is preached, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, the positives, the negatives, the ups, the downs, everything in between. If you stick around here long enough, you'll get it all. You'll get it all. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of what's in that book. It ought not to be. Susie told me that she was out with some of her Christian friends and she was witnessing to a couple that was sitting next to them and gave them a gospel track and witnessed to them. And some of her Christian friends were trying to encourage the people. Was it after you witnessed to them? Try to encourage them to come to their church. They have a food pantry. Hey, nothing wrong with a food pantry. I'll help some folks out with some food, but I'm more concerned with their soul. I'm more concerned with their soul. See, that's the whole new philosophy that's called pragmatism. It works. doesn't mean it's right. right? I mean, we could put a keg in here and get all the drunks, right? Couldn't we get all the drunks? Free beer. Couldn't we? We show movies and we get some people in here, couldn't we? Change the music. <laughs> we get a bunch of them. We can fill this place up. But that doesn't mean it's right because it works. Exactly. And around here, we're more concerned with the soul, the weightier matters, but we're not to leave the other undone also. If someone's hungry, feed them, man. Give them a coat. I took a coat to a guy in, in RTF, never met him before in my life. He knew I was a pastor. He knew I, we were in there for Bible study. He said, I need a coat. I said, all right, I'll get you a coat. I said, I'm in that business. <laughs> you ought to see my basement, right? Those that have seen my basement, I've got some clothes. And just so happened, I had a coat that just about fit him good enough. He needed a winter coat. He's like, this is all I got. All he had was like a hoodie. And I, he... He didn't seem real thankful or, I, don't, I just gave him a coat, amen. Maybe God will use that in the future. Remember that preacher that gave him a coat. Someone gave him something. Someone cared about him. Amen. But you know, first and foremost, what we're trying to do in RTF is give him the gospel and give him the word of God. That's the most important thing. No matter how many coats you got when you leave this life, no matter how much food you've been fed when you leave this life, or when you're leaving, you don't know, right? Neither does anyone else. So considering that fact, and we know not what tomorrow will bring, and life's like a vapor, we ought to be concerned about some folks' souls, right? And that's forever. Food's temporal. Clothing's temporal. Jesus died for the forever. Sins. He didn't pay that price to put clothes on your back, put food in your belly. That's not why he died. He died to save sinners. And how long is a saved sinner saved? See, it's eternal. That's an eternal thing. What a blessing. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. Last week I told you that I would begin each message with this verse. And let's read it, and I'd like to add this morning the next verse also to it. In verse 24, Paul says here, and he's speaking of when Jesus distributed the bread and the juice 
because it was juice. Got it? How do you know it was juice? Was the bread unleavened? Was the bread unleavened? Absolutely. It was unleavened bread. No corruption. No rising. Right? So you're trying to tell me that the wine was leavened? There's bubbles in the wine, right? No, it was juice. That's a whole other study we could do. I could take you through the Bible and show you every... You know how you study the Bible? Say, I want to study what's wine. Look at every single verse that uses the word wine. You know why Christians are confused about something like that? Because they're too just lazy. They won't search the Scriptures. They just have it in their mind. If it says wine, it must be fermented, something that could get you drunk. No, absolutely not. Just like when they see baptism, they think water. They just won't search the Scriptures. They're they're just lazy. They're just lazy. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman. Oh, it's going to take some work. Yeah, it's going to take some work. And you're going to have to fight the flesh and fight the world because the flesh doesn't want to get in that book and search the scriptures. The flesh would rather sit in front of a TV, right, and just gel out, right, just go to mush. This takes work. This takes work, if you want to know. I can show you two places in the Bible where it says, where it says to go gather the wine. What are you going to do with that? Don't tell me every time the Bible says wine, it's talking about fermented. It talks about new wine. What's new wine? That's when you take grapes and go like this. And you can drink gallons and gallons and gallons of it, and you never get drunk, right? Not until you let it rot and corrupt and add yeast to it. Did you know they add yeast to the wine to make wine? That's leaven. Don't tell me Jesus was drinking fermented wine at the Last Supper. But this is crazy. He wasn't eating, he wasn't eating, they weren't eating fermented bread with yeast. So why would the wine be fermented? Oh, boy, all this stuff, amen. But this is Paul. This is Paul referencing the Last Supper and what took place there. Now, he wasn't there. Paul wasn't there, but he knew quite a bit about it. Amen, and he wrote this. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now, we mentioned again, like I did last week, he said, this is my body. No, it's not. It wasn't his actual body broken? How do you know? His body wasn't broken yet. That's why he said, do this in remembrance of me. That bread represents his body. It's not his actual body. And if it was his actual body, and if it was his actual blood, guess what would that, what would that make you? Right? And you would, you would bust at least three commandments in the Bible before the law, under the law, and under grace where we're not to partake of blood. So it couldn't, be poss- couldn't possibly. How could it be his actual blood when it tastes just like juice? <laughs> so much for transubstantiation, if you know anything about that. You know, hocus pocus, turn the wine into his actual blood. All right. <laughs> Look at verse 25. Now look at, look at the first four words here. After the same manner. So when he gave the bread, he gave thanks and broke it. And then offered it. Right? After the same manner, so you could say that he took that cup and also gave thanks. And then offered it and distributed it. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this is the New Testament in my blood, This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now I want you to notice something there. It says as oft as ye drink it. So it doesn't say how often, does it? Does it say how often? Is there a requirement? You must take the Lord's Supper once a week. You must partake of the Lord's Supper communion once a month. All right, show me a verse, just one. Tell you how often. It just says as oft. Now, there's a pattern if you look through the Old Testament, the Jews and the Jewish feasts were once a year. So we try to do it around here at least once a year. You know why? Because I don't want it to be some vain, repetitious thing. This should be a very special, special event. And we do this in remembrance of Him. 
Uh, you know around here I'm always preaching Christ and always glorifying Jesus. So, I mean, just week in, week out, we're lifting him up. But this is a special thing. And next Sunday, as a church, we will partake and take communion, the Lord's Supper, together. Amen? And we'll go through all that next week. Now, last week, I gave you my first message on Thanksgiving, my first of three. This is my second. And last week, my text was, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. You know, I thought about that, and I thought, well, if in everything give thanks, there must be an awful lot of things to give thankful for, right, to be thankful for. If in everything we are to give thanks, there must be uh, quite a few things to be thankful for, if in everything we're to give thanks. And I preached how I'm thankful for everything, and I'm also thankful for nothing. I'm thankful for nothing. That is nothing to worry about, and nothing can separate me. And nothing of this world will be carried into the next. I'm thankful for those things. Nothing. You know, Paul said he knew how to abound and how to be abased. And in that, I see that the fact that Paul learned and he knew how to be thankful when he had nothing and when he had everything. I suppose if Paul was here today, you would, you would see him and talk to him and he'd be one of the most even-keeled, just middle of the road, just nothing upset him, nothing got him up too high or down too low, just walking with Christ, balanced, balanced. He was thank. what's that? I don't know, maybe, time, from time to time, I suppose. But he knew how to be thankful when he had nothing or very little, and when he had everything, he knew how to be thankful. Now, that's tough, for, that's tough for a lot of people, isn't it? That's tough for Americans because they expect to have everything. They expect it now. They expect it fast. And if their needs aren't met, if their wants aren't taken care of right now, they get upset. I want that light to turn green. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Race, 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 right? And you pull through the drive-thru and there's like 10 people in front of you. No! I know. I'm human. Amen. I know all about it. I know all about it. We ought to be thankful. You ever think about it? You get caught up in traffic. Maybe God's trying to protect you from something. How do you know? Maybe one day you will know. God say, you see that? I protected you. And you complained and you murmured and you weren't thankful. When you got caught in that traffic jam. And I can't stand traffic jams, but, you know, we need to learn to be thankful for everything because God knows why. He knows why. But in verses 24 and 25, in verse 24, it says that his body was broken for you. And after the same manner, he offered the cup. His blood was shed for you. Not for Lighthouse Baptist Church. Not for a religion, not for a denomination, not for a corporate group of people, but for individuals. You know who Jesus saves? He saves individuals. It's not like Emperor Constantine back in the 3rd or 4th century when he went out and just threw water on everybody. He baptized them all. Oh, you're all in Christ now, sprinkling water on them. It's not how it works. You know who gets saved? Individuals that individually come to Christ. And then that individual becomes a temple of the Holy Ghost. And his body and his blood, his body was broken and his blood was shed for you. So separate yourself and examine yourself and understand that Jesus did that for you. You know, that's one of the things that will bring someone to Christ. He did that for me. Yeah, he did that for you. That's what he did for you. He died, and his body was broken, and the Bible says his visage was marred more than any man. He was beaten to a pulp. You couldn't even recognize him. His mother was there, probably couldn't even recognize, couldn't even recognize him. And he did that for you. Yeah, you personally. That's why salvation has to be a personal thing. 
It has to be a personal thing. Right? You come to Calvary and it's a personal thing. And you understand and recognize and acknowledge what Jesus did for you. And then you come to Christ and put your faith and trust in him, calling upon his name. And by your faith in his works, he saves individuals. You know what that is? That, that for, for, the, for all the human race, for the entire human race, that remains the greatest and most generous of all things, of all deeds, of all works. The most charitable, the most compassionate work is what Jesus did for you. You could solve world hunger, and that would pale in comparison to what Jesus did for the human race. You could cure cancer. You could cure AIDS. You could cure every disease. You could solve world hunger. You could feed the world. You could give them water. You could give them everything under the sun. That doesn't even, that doesn't even hold a candle to what Jesus did for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, if everybody was living for Christ and walking in the Spirit, you'd have peace on earth. I can show you like one verse that would solve a lot of problems. Love your enemy. Well, that solves some problems, wouldn't it? You want to take care of that whole Palestinian and Israeli thing? There you go, one verse. But they can't do it without Christ. It's not possible without the Spirit of God. You can't love your enemies without the Spirit of God. It's impossible. It never will, never happen. That's the fruit of the Spirit, love. Supernatural love, to love someone that hates you and wants to kill you. And you'd wish that they were saved and born again just like you so you could be brothers. Yes. Do good to them that Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Is that Romans? God commendeth his love toward us, and while we're yet sinners, Christ's love for us. Romans 5. If anyone, if anyone knows what that's at, it's not Romans 5. I know what you're talking about, though. Is it Romans 12? We'll find it for you. I know exact. Nope. It's G it's in the Gospels. It's in the Gospels. It's in the Gospels. Jesus said that. I'll find it for you. I'll find it for you. Is it Matthew 12? That's what the Lord's telling you? Is that it? In Matthew 5.44? Come on, you Bible scholars. Where at Matthew? What? Matthew five verse forty-four. I know exactly what she's talking about. Yeah, that's it. Matthew five verse forty-four through forty-seven. 
Matthew 5, 44 through 47. The same sermon, same account, just recorded a little differently. 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do ye even do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren, only what do ye more than others do? Not even the publicans. What do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That would solve a lot of problems, wouldn't it? Right? Amen. That's a perfect work. That Jesus, through the Holy Spirit of God, can work the Holy Spirit of God can work that out through a child of God as impossible as that might seem with God all things are possible yes When he, was, when he was talking to that in Matthew, he's speaking to Israel clearly, all right? And he's speaking of them in reference to, almost always in reference to the earthly kingdom. But the, the, the reason we don't leave it there and say, you know, that was written to Israel pertaining to this kingdom is because Paul repeats it. Paul repeats it. You know, Jesus, when he came to this earth, his ministry was a ministry of transition. You see him transitioning from the law to grace. Grace came by the Lord Jesus Christ. The law came by Moses and grace and truth by the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see this in things like this. Love your enemies. Well, back there under the law, God told them to go conquer their enemies and take their lands. Now Jesus shows up and says, no, love your enemies. Love them, do good to them, love them, right? And you see him, he said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. When he healed on the Sabbath and did a work on the Sabbath or his disciples were plucking corn on the Sabbath, he said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath and that thing has changed. We don't have to keep the Sabbath. He's transitioning. You see this also in the woman caught in adultery. Did he say stoner? The lost, they came and said, Moses said stoner. Did he say to Stoner? No, he's transitioning from the law to grace. There's some preachers that are still hung up on that law. Like, we should kill all the homosexuals. Really? Well, show me where Jesus taught that and show me where Paul taught that. Right? That kill the adulterer too. How far are you going to go with that? How far are you going to go with that? You know what we should do with all the homosexuals? Let's round them up and kill them all. That's what it says right here in the Bible. Well, it also says if a child curses his parents, take them out and kill them. And breaks the Sabbath, take them out and kill them. Why are you stopping there? Don't stop with just one part of the law. You have to keep it all. I thank God for the grace of God. You know why don't we don't round up homosexuals and kill them? Because they can be saved. They can be born again. They can be safe from all their sins. Do you know why? Because Paul said, this dispensation of grace has been given to me to you, word. Take this grace out there now. And we're not under the law. We're under grace. That's why it's not capital punishment anymore for these things that were under the law, because we're not under the law. Things, people, things change from here to here, okay? Just get that. It's so clear. 
physical, spiritual. Yep. They're, they're, you know, there's a couple verses, there's a couple verses like that, okay, where it says that you need to separate yourself from if they're covetous, if they're given over to idolatry, if they're fornic- in fornication, but he, here's what, here's what we have here nowadays. We're dealing with, we're dealing with just, I mean, everybody, we're living in this country where I mean, a good majority of Christians are given over to something, covetousness. So where do you draw the line? Why do you draw the line? Because we're to be light. About fornication. No, it's it's Bible. It's Bible. But there's a there's a purpose for you separating yourself. And it's to bring them to the truth. Right? It's not a judgmental thing like I'm better than you. And that's how some Christians portray it. I don't want to deal with them. I don't want to have anything to do with them. They're wicked. That that's not the attitude. The attitude is, you know what? I want, you to, I want you to be right with God, and I love you, and I care about you, and I want you to serve God, and I want you to, to get victory over this. And because of this, I have to step back, and I, we can't have the, 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 the sweet fellowship that we could have. Exactly. <laughs> Here's where... Uh, uh, this is where we're at, because, listen, when sin is abounding, we have mass confusion. It's mass confusion, right? And we have these things in the Bible that are very clear. It's just, it's mass confusion. And I, this is just me personally, I leave it up to the individual to where they draw the line. You know, I mean, we could just set down laws and just draw the line, and, and then I stand up here and just put everybody under this same law, and you have to personally, this is between you and the Lord, where do you draw the line? Amen. Yep. Yes, wrote. You know, it it really it really is a it really is a motive thing. Did Jesus eat with sinners? What did what do you mean he's breaking the what the word of God says? Why did Jesus eat with sinners? Why did Jesus sit down with the publicans, the thieves? Why did he sit down with them to be a light to them? To be a light to them. I think it really has more to do with you. You going along with them. You can sit down and have dinner with someone and not be on the same page as not going along with them and not allowing them to pull you this way, but you in your heart and your motive trying to pull them this way. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. It depends if we've had we've had folks that are actually trying to divide the church to cause division you know and the church as a whole is more it's more important than one person the church as a whole is more important than me right it's more important than anyone this is a, this is a this is a fellowship this is a unity this as a whole is more important than one individual and we can't let one individual, and that includes me or anyone else, divide it. And God, God hates, uh, he hates the sowing of discord among brethren. He hates that, the Bible says. So that's one of those things. But when it comes to that verse, it really has to do with why. Because Jesus did sit down and he did eat with sinners, but what was his motive? Why? To draw them to him. And I understand you're kind of reading it cut and dry, like it's it's not as cut and dry because could that person say to you, hey, yeah, I know that. She says she's a Christian. I don't invite her to lunch. She won't even come to lunch. What kind of Christian is that? Uh, I, I, mean, I can I, I can give you at least one example and I'm gonna get I'm listen. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you at least one example in the next service, if I get to it, amen of where Paul broke bread and ate with sinners. But what was Paul's motive? Right? Not to go along with them. When you're talking about eating, you're talking about a fellowship. You're joining. Yes. Yep. Peter wouldn't eat with Gentiles. But I think that's a reference to Gentile Christians. They were already saved. But yeah, Paul did rebuke Peter. When, you're, when we're talking about salvation, you are individually saved. You are, the te- you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, right? You, between you and God, there's many things that you have to draw the line somewhere, and you have to come to your own determination and decision. Paul, de- Paul dealt with that when it came to holidays, when it came to special days, when it came to eating certain kinds of food. He said, that's between you and God. We're not under this cut and dry law anymore. That's, all, that's in the book of Romans, a couple different times where Paul talks about that. You know, if you honor this day unto the Lord, such as Christmas, December 25th, which December 25th, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. Not at all. You can prove that. But what if you take the, took that day? What if you took April 2nd or March 3rd and, and you gave that day and you honored that day and you celebrated his birthday and you glorified the fact that he was born? If you honor that day unto the Lord and your heart's right and that's your real motive, then I'm not to judge you. But then if I say, if I say on the other hand, you know what, I don't want to celebrate Christmas, you know, and I, I have some convictions of my own, then you shouldn't judge me. It's... Right. It's you have to come to the own, your own determination and understanding and draw the line. It's, and it's with everything nowadays because it really is so confusing. Music, take music. Where do you draw the line? <laughs> right? Where do you draw the line with this? Where do you draw the line with movies? Where do you draw the I mean, you could separate yourself from all of it and get rid of it and just go live in the woods. Right? You could take that verse, you're not to eat with anyone that's covetous. It talks about covetousness too. Yeah, it talks about covetousness. Not the fellowship with those. It's in book, book of Corinthians. But what if, but what if your motive's right? And it's, you know what? I know that they're in this sin and I know they're like this, but you know what? I want to be a light to them. How can I be a light to them if I just totally separate myself and never have anything to do with them and never talk to them and say, and it really, it, to them, it puts you on a pedestal like they, they think they're better than me. And that wasn't Jesus. Oh, absolutely. Yep. What's up, Dan? Yep.
That's part of the perfect law of liberty. It talks about the perfect law of liberty. You know, back here under the law, it was just, it was, it's just cut and dry. Do this, don't do this, period. I mean, it was just so cut and dry. This is the sacrifice that you offer for this sin. This is the sacrifice that you offer for this sin. Take it down to the priest and just all cut and dry. Really, back here, it was, believe it or not, it seems like it's more simplified like this is what we have to do. Where now the Holy Spirit's in you and we have this perfect law of liberty and we're not under the law, we're under grace. Even Paul said, I don't want to put too much on the Gentiles. Right? He didn't want to put too much on the Gentiles. Just a couple different things. Don't eat things that are strangled. Like, because back then they would take animals and they would strangle them, kill them, and offer them as sacrifice. Don't eat of those animals that were offered for sacrifice. Well, we don't have to worry about that, do we? We have to be concerned about that? I mean, maybe there's some spiritual way to look at that. or yeah. Don't drink blood. Sacrifice. Don't drink blood. He said, I don't want to put too much on the Gentiles. But I'm telling you, a lot of these legalistic churches, that's what they do. Like, here's Paul. Here's Paul said, I don't want to put all this stuff on the Gentiles. Just a couple little things. Just a couple things. I don't want to bring them under bondage. I want them to have freedom and liberty because we're under grace. But then you come to some churches like you have to do this and you have to do this and 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 all the rules and dress this way and do this and do this and do this. It's like, my goodness, man, and you can never seem like you measure up. Yeah, it's been sacrificed to idols. Yeah. There were young Christians that they were trying to I'm telling you, it's all a personal thing in using wisdom. It's using wisdom. You know, like you said, here you have a, someone that professed to be saved and now they're just totally living in sin. You know what the best thing you could do for them? The best thing you do for them is rebuke them. <laughs> rebuke them sharply that they be, you know, that they be sound in the faith. Exactly. We, you have to, we, the, the church has to draw a line. Yeah. Amen. You know, and that's a whole nother aspect. That's a whole nother aspect, you know. You know someone that's, you know they're not doing right, but what if they're honest? And what if God's really working on them? What should you do? Oh, I don't want anything to do with you. No, man. Hug on them. Pray for them. I thought those that are weak in the faith, those that are strong in the faith, are supposed to bear their burdens and help them up. Yep. Yeah. Well, amen, amen. From, from my studies, it's late October or early November, sometime around that time. September? So why do I get October? There's a way, there's a biblical way to kind of pinpoint it. It has to do with uh, the course of a biome or what was it, the course of a, the priest course. John the Baptist's father, he was a priest 
and he had his course, his time where he had to go to the temple for a month or whatever his course was. And you can trace that when that course was. And then Jesus was born six months after that. There's, there's a way mathematically in the Bible to kind of pinpoint it. But all you have to do really is study December 25th. And you'll realize that, that was, that's the winter solstice, the, all that stuff. It's all, it's, that date is a pagan date. Yeah, before Christ was even born, they were they were upholding that date. But like I said, if you take that date and honor it unto the Lord, I can, who am I to judge you? If you're really, if you're truly honoring that unto the Lord and giving that day unto the Lord, that's between you and the Lord. But you see, under the law, it wouldn't be so. It'd be cut and dry. <laughs> Romans fourteen. One man esteemeth the day above another. One man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind, it says. See, there's that personal thing. You be fully persuaded in your own mind. One person says don't eat this. One person don't says eat this. If someone has a conviction about eating a certain food, don't go around them like, look at me, I can do it, you know, offending them. <laughs> read, the, read those chapters. <laughs> they wouldn't agree on everything. Well, you know, it's got to begin with the gospel. What's their foundation for their faith in a God? You know, if it's not the gospel, then they're, they haven't even begun in the right place. If they haven't begun with the proper foundation, if, they don't ha if they're not building upon the proper foundation, which many aren't, they have all their own concept of God, and, but their foundation is not the gospel. If they can't take you to where this is where I put my faith and trust in the gospel and I believe the gospel and I know that I'm saved because of what Jesus did, this is my foundation and they're building upon that, then, you know, obviously something's wrong because they're not building upon the right foundation. So it always comes back to the gospel. It always comes back to the foundation, which no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. The gospel and his works are the foundation. Sure. First Corinthians chapter fourteen. Well, the con the context there is uh, spiritual gifts, the gifts of tongues. So that's the context. You got to kind of keep it within the context. But then, you know, there is some there is some truth to that as far as a woman a woman should be learning from her husband also, because you guys the husband's supposed to be the head of the home, the spiritual leader, and. Yeah. You know, that, that, there's, there's a whole other verse where some churches might draw the line, legalistic churches, and say women should just be totally silent, never say anything. But, you know, I'm just not, I'm not going to take it that far. Now, if there's a lady that's disruptive and causing problems and purposely asking questions to try to cause division or to raise doubt, then there's something we have to deal with. But the same thing with a man. It should be the same thing with a man. I, I, I just like to give everyone, I just like to give you liberty. I want you to have liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And if I don't create an atmosphere of liberty, how can the Spirit work if I'm trying to bind you? I want you to have some liberty. But use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. So just be careful, careful with how you use your liberty. There's so much in that book, people. Amen? And amen. 
You know, and it all comes back to with, with each and every one of us, why? And that's something you have to determine. I can't determine why you do something. I don't know for sure what's in your heart. God, only God knows, right? Like you ask questions, well, well, why? Is it because you seriously, earnestly, and have a desire to know because you want to follow the Lord and you love Jesus and you want to have a closer personal relationship? Or is it just to cause problems or it is, you know, if you, it's, it's here. It's motive. Why? And that's why you have to judge yourself, examine yourself, examine your motive. And there's all kinds of things, in, you know, especially in Proverbs, Solomon talks about the tongue and, you know, even a, what, what's talking about? Even someone that just always quiet, he'll seem wise because he never says anything. But then someone that's always, they show themselves to be a fool, you know. <laughs> always yapping. Never <laughs> All right, let's take a break. Amen. Hey, that's good. That's good. That's good. All right? Listen, when you go to, when you, if you're a part of a church, you ought to be able to ask questions. Shouldn't you? Shouldn't you be able to ask questions? If you have a concern? You wanna, if you want to know something? Yeah, you can ask questions in school, right? Sunday school. A lot, of, a lot of Christians are afraid to ask anything because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to seem like that guy that's always, you know. But I, it, doesn't, it, doesn't bo- it doesn't bother me a bit. It doesn't bother me a bit. Amen. I sat under a Bible teacher that had questions and answers. And you could ask him anything under the sun. And you know what he'd do? He'd say, all right, turn over here and 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 look at this and look at this and look at this. And before you know it, guess what? More often than not, he'd give you a Bible answer. The answers are in there. But under grace, like I said, it's not as cut and dry because you have to deal with the whole personal aspect, your relationship between you and Christ. And that's grace. That's what grace offers you. And I thank the Lord for grace. It's a wonderful thing. Tell an ancient friend, what to do is it. Why as you do it. <laughs> yeah, why as you do it. All right, let's take a break.